Street. I'm delighted to introduce our two breakfast briefers. First of all, Andrea Metcalf, who has just appeared on my screen and hopefully on yours, uh, the National Archives' new Director of People, Inclusion and Change. So Andrea is responsible for delivering our commitment to further strengthen culture and approach so that we continually strive to better reflect and represent the society we serve. She's focused on developing and leading our people strategy, building an organisational culture, delivering the new ways of working programme, and building a more representative workforce, which sets a strong example and influences change across the archive sector. Andrea was formerly Deputy Director of People and Culture at ActionAid UK and has a wealth of experience in HR, diversity and inclusion, organisational change and development and coaching. She's previously been a director of a number of HR consultancies working across various sectors and also a university lecturer specialising in employment law, coaching and mentoring. Andrea, can I invite you to say hello? Hello, everyone. And I'm really delighted to be here this morning. I am a woman in my early 50s. I'll push it a little bit. I've got uh, very short brown hair, brown eyes, and I am wearing a purple top. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to introduce Rachel Minot. Um, I think Rachel's hopefully going to appear on our screens any moment now. Uh, Rachel is a Jamaican-born artist, curator and researcher. She's currently Inclusion and Change Manager at the National Archives, and she's also a trustee of the Museum of Homelessness. Previously, she's been chair of the Museum Association's Decolonising Guidance Working Group and curator of the Horniman Museum and Gardens, Birmingham Museums Trust and London Transport Museum. As an artist, she's exhibited internationally. Rachel's going to be taking up the role of Joint Head of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the National Archives at the end of this month. So it was only announced yesterday, so we're delighted to have Rachel. She hasn't even started yet, so we're deeply grateful for her, uh, to her for, for appearing with us. So Rachel, welcome. Um, can't see you at the moment, so um, if you could turn your camera on, that would be great. But if you can't, um, it would it would still be great if we could still invite you to say hello and introduce yourself if you're struggling with the technology, <laughs> Rachel. Good morning, everyone. I have, I've turned my camera on and off again. Hopefully, eventually I shall appear. Um, but it's really lovely to join everyone. Um, my name is uh, Rachel Minot. I'm, and my preferred pronouns are she, her. I have brown curly hair, I'm wearing glasses, a chunky headset, um, some fabulous earrings and a white shirt, which hopefully those who are sighted can see when the camera works. I'm also mixed race, but I don't really know how to describe that visually, but I know that it's important to put that context in. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, and I know that the, the team are, are working with you to, to get the camera um, issue sorted. So hopefully we'll, um, we'll uh, see you on screen uh, as soon as we can. So introductions over, I want to now open the conversation. So um, I want to start with Andrea. Um, so these are both new roles, Andrea, your own as Director of People, Inclusion and Change. And obviously, as soon as you came in, you've, you've created a, a second role, um, a new Head of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And I want to start by asking you why why did the National Archives create these roles or why did they create your role and then why did you create the the second role and why why now thanks well I think the why now um is very much linked to our strategy archives for everyone since the start of the strategy we've been doing some really great work around inclusion in particular and in fact in terms of our strategy the inclusion element really came from our staff which is absolutely great and what that means is that there's lots and lots of different work going on in in different teams and i think it was felt by the exec team that actually they needed someone to bring it all together to really look strategically at how we look after our people, how we do change and make sure that inclusion is embedded in all of that. So I think that's why um, they then went out to recruit. And when I joined, um, I was very excited um, that the exec team was also very much on board with a head of diversity, equity and inclusion role, because actually in order for us to get real momentum, 
we need people really focused on it and dedicated to it, uh, which is why we have recruited to the role. And I'm really excited that both of our co-heads are internal and are going to be quite a duo, I think. And it really does strengthen the our approach to inclusion and hopefully will also strengthen our ability to support the sector and learn from the sector as well. Definitely two-way. Excellent. Thanks very much. I can see Rachel is um, uh, still battling to get her camera um, working. So I'm going to, I'll stay with you, Andrea, for the moment, if, if you don't mind. Um, and then we can um, come to Rachel. That I, not only, obviously, she's trying to do her camera, it's difficult to focus on answering questions. Um, so what, what do you want to achieve in, in an ideal world, which we're not in, but that we, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can but dream? Um, what would you, you know, what, 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 are you, what are your aims? What do you want to achieve in, in the role? Okay, so if we we think of the the National Archives in five, ten years, um, what I would really like is for everyone to feel a sense of belonging here, whether they are working here or whether they are interacting with us in any um, shape or form. I really want everyone to just instinctively embrace the advantages of having diverse opinions in the conversation. Um, and that includes working more closely with partners and the community. So I'd like us to be much more co-creating and actually enabling um, other archives to tell their stories rather than than us think that we need to do all of that ourselves so very much this whole kind of co-creation piece and to make sure that all communities are represented both in terms of our workforce and all the work that we're doing so that comes from research the way we interact with academia the way we interact with other other archives that there's um, a humility and a sense of of sharing and learning that's mm. my ideal world that sounds that sounds really exciting um so back in the real world um <laughs> and hopefully we you know on a serious note we want to make sure that the, the real moves towards the ideal what are you going to start with because that is quite that's quite a lot there um you know getting representation from from all the communities we serve co-creation and so on all, all great things but how where are you going to start what are we going to see coming out of the national archives that might um that might seem different and hello morning rachel we have you on screen so um i will come to you in a, in a moment as well but um rachel just because uh, i know you've been uh dipping in and out i was just asking andrea what she wanted to achieve uh in an ideal world so i'll come to you and ask you that um in, in a moment but i was just asking andrea what she's going to kind of start with because she's outlined her a vision of of a much more inclusive representative um uh, National Archives co with co-creation and so on um, and I was just asking her what because it's quite a big vision where, what she's going to start with um, so over to you Andrea and then I'll, I'll come back to you Rachel. Uh, a few things so one of the one of the key things is actually the head of diversity equity and inclusion now in post which I'm absolutely thrilled for um, and the, uh, and a few other things that we're doing. We are undertaking a culture programme at the moment and becoming an inclusive archive is a critical part of that. So we're, we're really putting together people's thoughts on what it would mean for us to be more inclusive. And what we will be doing is creating a behaviour framework that then sits behind everything we do. So at least everyone has a sense of how we want to interact and what's really important to us. Um, we then are looking at our visual identity. So I've been having conversations with various people across the organisation to really challenge us in terms of how we represent ourselves, both in the written word and in our visuals, so that we continually improve and strengthen our ability to be reflective of the 
the the not so comfortable areas of our past as well as the the areas that um people are quite rightly proud of um it, there's always two sides to every story and i think you know that's one thing that we we're really looking at is making sure that as many perspectives are included as possible so that's where we're we're starting um, in terms of as an organization, I mean, Rachel has been doing some fabulous work, I know, with the sector as part of the archive sector development team. So there's a load of work um, that Rachel's been doing that people will see. So a lot of the work that I'm doing is very much behind the scenes, um, apart from the visual identity. And Rachel is going to I think um be doing a lot of that work so I'm going to hand over to Rachel because it seems the perfect time to bring Rachel in to talk about what the sector might see from us um coming forward perfect Rachel so um am I answering to what do we want to achieve in this ideal world or from the sector perspective just to clarify um I, for me, it's it's talking about what you'd want to achieve and what um what we might see from TNA. How would we know that you know what what's what are we going to see that's different? Well, I'm really interested in understanding how we can pursue inclusion um, from our unique selling point as a national archives. Um, in and I think one of the key place, ways that we can do that is that we foster a culture where we are a site where people come to understand each other better. And so that means that people feel that they can come as employees into the organization and bring their whole selves and as um, visitors and bring their whole selves without the needing, feeling the need to mask uh, maybe differences to meet societal expectations where we're all practicing kindness and generosity in our interactions as our default. And that where everyone, regardless of their kind of culture, can find authentic and interesting representations in, about themselves in history. And so they can see and, and understand their place in making history and project into the future what they want um, and be aspirational. Because I think at the moment what we have is, um, is an imbalance in who feels that they can use the archive in this way that creates aspirations for the future where they see themselves as powerful agents in change where they um, are listened to and well represented and valued um, so the change I'd want people to see is actually more how I want people to feel um, to feel ownership of the space feel uh, able to be loud and, and interact and engage with us and and know that that we welcome that and we want to have conversations and that we're excited to be challenged because we want to learn for, about ourselves we want to learn about other people we're really genuinely curious and we're encouraging curiosity that's absolutely inspirational um so uh wow i'm blown away by by that answer an amazing answer thank you rachel um i want to pick up um now on an, an unusual word um in in actually rachel in your in your job title um so just to remind everybody rachel's new role is head of diversity equity and inclusion and i know andrea's told me that a couple of people thought that was a spelling mistake uh and, and so for so what oh, you've you've left you've left the a and the l out should be it shouldn't it be equality and uh and it shouldn't have been it, it should have been equity it was right um it was not supposed to be equality at all so um Andrea, I'm going to come to you first and, and then to Rachel to ask, obviously, I know it was a conscious choice, so I don't need to ask you that, but what did you want to signal with that, with that very specific choice of, of wording? Yes, I think it definitely surprised a few people. Um, so sending an email to say, no, it wasn't a typo, um, was quite a, a, a humorous moment for me. And I think, you know, I've, I've had this in various organisations that there's been a focus on equality and that has led people to um, want to treat everybody the same. And actually, by doing so, it perpetuates some of the disadvantages that certain um, people have in that kind of system. So if you if you. I, there's a wonderful um, image of 
um, three children looking at a, a sports game and one is um, able to see over the fence because they're quite tall. Um, another, sorry, they are on um, blocks. So the first one is on one block and can see over the fence. The next one is also on one block, but can't see over the fence because they're not tall enough. So actually, in order for the person to have equal opportunity to see the game in front of them, they need two blocks to be able to see over the fence. And that's what equity is about. It's about actually focusing on the outcome, which is equality of opportunity, rather than treating everybody the same. And in order to ensure that people have equality of opportunity, you need equity. So you need to look at how do you level the playing field? What do you need to put in place to enable people to join in and have those opportunities that they wouldn't normally do? And in as a system, in terms of an organisation, it's then looking at what are the things that we do as an organization that means there's a fence there in the first place so how can we actually dismantle some of the systems and structures that we have within an organization that prevents people from just being their authentic selves which who Rachel beautifully described in terms of bringing their whole selves to um to the national archives um, and to society as a whole, because there are so many people who feel that they need to mask, not just when they come here, but actually in society. So there's a kind of a, I would love society to replicate what Rachel was talking about, rather than just the National Archives. Thank you. That's a, that's a lovely analogy. I really like that one. So I, I shall be remembering that one because I think it, it illustrates a number of of points in a really nuanced way uh, and a better really effective way so uh thanks for that it's really interesting i'm going to come back to the equity word but i just want to flip over to rachel and ask her about the equity word and um did, did you notice it when you when you applied that it was not equality that it was equity and what, and what does that mean to you and how how do you think it's going to change uh or will it change the way you kind of operate in the role what what are your thoughts on the kind of equity word well, I was very excited. Um, I, I know equity is a, in, in the context of inclusion. I know a lot of people are familiar with the word from finance and thought it was about investment. And um, <laughs> I've never even thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is that inclusion works it's in, um, is needed because there's exclusive practices and exclusive realities. Equality work is needed because there's inequality. Diversity work is needed because there is a lack of diversity. And so whilst we are very much focused on the positive and the outcome, the, the, the action we want to, to enact, a lot of the access questions, accessibility actions we're doing are because there is a barrier that we really need to see and focus on. And in this work, equality is the end game. We're looking for an equal society, but you don't start the journey at the destination. And if we just try to put equality in now, as Andrea said, some people end up getting more than they need to, to meet their needs, and some people won't get enough to meet that same need. And um, equity is about understanding that there is a history of inequality that needs to be rectified before the balance sheet is equal enough that people can flourish in equality. There are other principles that um, influence this work, and some of them are justice principles. And, and like Andrew said, that's about thinking about what is that barrier in the first place before we need to equip everybody with tools to overcome the barrier. Maybe we can remove the barrier. Um, but equity as a focus means that we are exploring this through the questions of what is the reality that's come before us? What is the need now? And then we're on our journey to equality, but we're not pretending we're closer to the end point than we are. We're aware that this is a big undertaking that will require a lot of thought and a lot of energy and a lot of um, participation from people and listening to real needs. Um, so yeah, that's what, what equal equity means to me in the situation of equality. 
Great, really, really interesting. Now, can I just remind people if you do um, wish me to ask um, anything uh, of Andrea and Rachel on your behalf, please do post it in the Q and A. I'm keeping my eyes open, so um, so uh, there's an opportunity there for you, for you to ask your own questions. Um, in the meantime, I want to stick with the equity word for the moment uh, and go back to Andrea. And and um, you were talking about how it meant um, a, a kind of different approach because obviously people have different needs as Rachel's also described so how is that going to kind of work in in practice does it mean a, a, you'll be kind of not exactly targeting but kind of um putting together sort of programs or initiatives that that speak to a particular community those with perhaps socio-economic challenges people with uh, different abilities people with challenges of all sorts you know obviously there are all sorts of communities that as Rachel and you have both described face different challenges um different barriers different fences how how is that going to work in practice addressing all those communities because it can you know obviously there's there's intersectionality between the different communities and different challenges so it's quite a complex field how how is that how are you going to make that work i think it's a very admirable thing i'm just wondering how it's going to work in practice without becoming possibly compl complicated <laughs> i think and I'll, I'll pick up some of the words that that rachel um has just used and that is about understanding the barrier so you know, one of the first things we need to understand is why there isn't the representation, what stops people either progressing or um, being attracted to us in the first place. We're trying all sorts of different ways of looking at recruitment. So, for example, um, looking at the language we use when we go out to recruit and making sure that um, it is neutrally gendered, or dare I say it, slightly feminine, mm -hmm. because actually loads of research says that actually um, that doesn't influence um, our male um, colleagues applying. So it's just looking at the balance of, of the words that we, that we use and how we represent and also the barriers that we put in an advert in the first place. So, you know, really testing um, hiring managers in terms of do they really need those academic qualifications? And how do we ensure that actually people with lived experience are feel as able to have a voice in our work as people with um, uh, high academic qualifications. And that's not to downplay those at all, but it's to look at whether there's a way of having both of those in play, because actually um, the intersection between lived experience and academic is really interesting and brings a richness so it's it's looking at things like that and, and looking at the the barriers. So barriers, for example, um, where you think that something is a really good idea, but actually when you look into it, it it's it's not. So there's been a lot of talk about four day week. Um, and people actually working their five days in four. Well, that's great if you don't have children, you don't have caring responsibilities, etc. So, again, it's something that sounds great and is really in vogue, but actually has some really unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And it's making sure that you're constantly thinking about that and really challenging how you're doing things to be more inclusive. You'll, you'll never be fully inclusive. This is a journey. This is something that that you will that all of us uh, will need to continually consciously have as part of our everyday working. And I will shut up. <laughs> no, I will get off on a roll. So <laughs> get I'll on a roll. We like see rolls. What, see, see what you think. <laughs> Can I just before Rachel before I invite you in? I was quite interesting because I um uh, for those of you on on the call who who were there too, I I, I chaired one of the keynotes yesterday. Um. 
uh, around lunchtime with Regina Everett and Alec Ward and Josie Fraser talking about digital skills. And, and that issue about someone asked a, a question about do we st- what about the, this kind of privileging of, of professional qualifications? Should we uh, should we still demand those? And, and, and Regina said, obviously, that there are some things where, you know, if you need to code Python, you need to be able to do it. But there are loads of other areas where, you know, people were starting to bring in. And, and I think it was Alec talked about um, his shift and not having qualifications for, you know, and building on formal sorry I don't want to kind of downgrade his his uh, experience but it, he'd he he was using his lived experience and his work experience as well as qualifications and Josie was also commenting on how 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 that's changing that context where people are much more willing rightly to to kind of take into consideration uh, all the skills people have built up mm. um, during their working life, and um, and I came into the conversation at that point, and because we, we were talking about the need for a piece of paper, so all of the three round the table were were talking about um, uh, leading and creating um, digital skills courses and programs, uh, and and not the problem, but a challenge can be people often need something like I have done this course, or I have got this diploma or certificate, something they can take away, um, because otherwise it can be um in in a in a sort of very formal traditional cv kind of recruitment thing you know people want a certificate or they want a a, a kind of piece of paper and it can be difficult to to demonstrate those uh those skills that and and those experiences that you've built up over your career um and i can see andrew <laughs> waving like crazy <laughs> trying to come in on that point so i will go to, to andrea before uh before and she explodes with frustration and then we will come to you rachel andrea clearly want to say something about that i do <laughs> and i think this is this is one of those areas where i would say we need to be more challenging of ourselves because actually there's a whole host of things we can do at interview so if you change the way we interview you change the outcome so you can actually do tests and you can get people to um do those codings and actually they can show you what they can do they don't need that piece of paper so there's a whole host of things that we can do we've just got to be brave enough and bold enough to kind of say okay we're going to do something a bit different to hire to um rachel's role we did something really different we did have no cvs so we had absolutely no cvs it was all done on work-based questions on to to really get their thinking about and their experience but in a way that actually also reflected the role and i think we've got a really great great outcome as a result of that that might not have happened if we'd done it in a more traditional way because people might not have applied had it been done in a more traditional way so i just had to come in on that (laughs) that's fine so rachel can i ask you two things one i'd be quite interested to to hear about your experience on the other side of that a very non-traditional approach and how it felt as a as a candidate but also um if you uh, have any any other thoughts about you know what we're talking about anyway uh, about sort of recruitment skills how you demonstrate skills that kind of thing so over to you yeah i mean it was uh I, I found it actually quite a fun application to do, um, which is a weird thing to say. Um, but the questions were very much, uh, how would you deal with, and um, this is a scenario, and in this role, you would be asked to do that. And it was very revealing of what the job would be, uh, which was really interesting for me, because it's a new role, and it's difficult to imagine what the responsibilities are going to be, and where it's going to sit, and what the focuses are imagined. So that was really insightful as an applicant to see with the scenarios. And then it was great to be able to to showcase what my values were, not just what my experience had been. So I could say that I would approach this because these were my values, and this is the approach I would take based on what I learn and and what I I know and what I I want to share so that was from the other side that was good and it was short I didn't have to put in you find out the dates of when I did my (laughs) GCSEs or you know (laughs) go back through my qualifications in that way and and sometimes I I guess I have certain um concerns as uh, somebody with multiple marginalized identities that some of my identities might be um, used against me um, unconsciously and because who I was in terms of you know my age and 
uh, my gender and all of those things didn't come into play into the, how I answered those questions, I could feel quite confident that 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 if that was going to be held against me, it'd be held against me at a later stage. Um, <laughs> but I didn't, I, so it felt great because I could just showcase my ambitions and, and, and my desires in that. Um, the, 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 um, in terms of the recruitment question for uh, wider kind of inclusion, I think having worked with the sector for a while and worked in the um, heritage sector in general for a longer, I know that one of the, a focus point in diversity in terms of inclusion is often entry points into the sector. Um, but unfortunately, we don't tend to focus on the retention and the um, the investment going forward. And so we get a lot of drop off and we get a lot of people who come into the sector really ambitious and excited on these kind of schemes who find that they really quickly reach a block where progression is difficult or they'd have to retrain. And, and so the barriers that didn't allow that weren't there to start to get into the sector are absolutely there the next level up. Um, and so I would love for us to focus more on the sort of what are transferable skills? What can someone bring in in mid-level and senior level that might not be um, might not be achieved if someone came through the linear approach and you know had the you know the same archive having having the archiving MA and then had archiving experience and then managed an archive? Actually, what can somebody who could manage an archive but has doesn't have those skills below could they offer and what could they offer in terms of an inclusive and diverse environment? And then I know in the wider sector, there's a lot of conversations within this moment of, of economic insecurity about how to talk about our skills as transferable, how to kind of present what we do as valuable in multiple sectors. Um, and that includes understanding what we do as something that can be transferred in as well as something that can be transferred out. Um, so I think it'd be, it, it'd be really exciting for us to open up that debate and think about our our jobs and the sector beyond the qualification and actually the skills and it will help with that kind of investment because it also give people more feel more equipped to have more roots up even if we don't have maybe the the obvious kind of progression routes available if it's like a small archive or if there's not you know enough money to create a new um uh, job. I was really encouraged in the conversation that you chaired yesterday about, you know, the idea about how people really thrive when they're invested in. Even if you have the risk of losing the people you invest in, actually you're creating an environment that more people are attracted to, more opportunities for people behind, and that person feeling as though they have more um, possibilities for the future, which is really something invaluable. Okay, Rachel, I'm going to stick with you because you talked quite a lot about the sector. So I wanted to ask um, the two of you, I'll start with you, uh, Rachel, since you've got the, the microphone. Because um, obviously archives, cultural heritage and academia do have particular cha challenges in representation from from some communities, which is very, very low. And what, what do you think the particular issues are for the kind of broader cultural heritage sector in uh, in terms of kind of diversity, equity and inclusion? I think there are a lot of um, problems that are uh, symptomatic of societal problems and mirror, mirror that. But for the idea of the unique selling point of heritage organizations, it tends to be our collections and how we use them. And for a lot of marginalized identities, what that means is that a lot of the collections we own are either about the historical oppression of those marginalized communities, but from the voice of those who oppressed rather than the voice of the people who fought for their own equality and freedom. Um, and then the ones that we do have, which have the voice and agency to people who were marginalized or um, discriminated against, it's they're not that discoverable. There's low confidence in how we will deal with these collections. So they're, they're not being used to their potential. And so that idea of people feeling attracted to the the sector because they love history, they feel excited about it, they feel this they see themselves in it, they want to contribute to it, manage it. You can have that from a diverse perspective about things that are not to do with your identity, but it helps to have things that feel familiar to draw certain people in. And it hurts if you are from a marginalized community to only see either bad representation um, or no representation. Um, so 
one of the things we do have to work on is how do we deal with the collections that we have? How do we make them richer? How do we make them more discoverable? How do we engage people in kind of the use of them? Because I think that will help um, raise the confidence of us using them more. And I see this happening a lot in the sector. The sector has actually been doing a great deal since the pandemic um, in terms of, I think, as horrible as the pandemic has been and continues to be, it did provide a lot of opportunities for certain um, organizations that had the resources to do this, to pause, think about what was important to them, and to start to do that deep dive research that requires that time, energy, and thought. So I do think that in the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing the um, impact of that. Um, but I think it needs to grow with, with momentum rather than slow down because we're returning to a version of, of events that... Um, or ways of working that that is not compatible with that slow thinking and that development and that consultation um so yeah those are my my initial thoughts thanks before i come to andrew i'm going to draw we've had a question from um from ian which is kind of relevant to the to this discussion so i'm going to draw that in uh and thanks very much for the question ian so um ian saying it's great to hear andrea saying that she welcomes diverse opinions and he's been campaigning um about inclusion for an archives for for a long time. I'm going to paraphrase Ian because it's quite a long question and I know we're a bit tired on time. Um, but but finding that parts of the uh, glam community have, have very entrenched positions, um, which they're perhaps unwilling to consider. Um, uh, because, uh, there's, there's a piece about, um, you know, using particular language, whether someone think, you know, how, how someone addresses things like identity politics, theory of white privilege and so on. Um, so, and Ian said he's he's finding viewpoints immediately get shut down. So he, he wanted to ask how Andrea and Rachel, you're going to ensure that the issues are, are properly considered and discussed so that, you know, people have a, a forum to, to talk about issues which can be incredibly uh, contentious, incredibly sensitive. And where where are the forums for where such discussions can take place? I mean, talk, talking here about the archives profession, but obviously it's gonna, this is going to apply across the piece to libraries, museums, academia as well. I wonder if you could kind of um, have a go at, at drawing that, that one into the discussion as well. Andrea, I'll go for, like okay. <laughs> for you first. Yeah. <laughs> It's a really interesting question and one that um, is quite challenging. Uh, from my previous role, this was something we discussed a lot, actually, um, and that was in the charity sector. And from my experience, it is about the, the two words that Rachel used in her wonderfully inspiring ideal world. And they are kindness and generosity. Yeah. Because actually, we need to meet people where they are. We need to understand their viewpoints. And by doing so, we become richer ourselves. So rather than shutting down a viewpoint that is counter to um, your own, Actually, the, the other word that Rachel used, which I absolutely love, is curious. Be curious about what their viewpoint is um, and how it might actually shape your own. So, because that's the way we learn. We learn through experimentation. We learn by stretching ourselves. And um, there are lots of different perspectives and they are that they are someone's perspective and it's important that you recognize that and that that forms part of the the conversation and i would love more forums to be like that where you you're not you don't feel you have to justify your opinion and instead of people there's a a, a a wonderful phrase seek to understand before seeking to be understood and actually to go into those conversations seeking to understand the point of view rather than to defend your own easier said than done um, in a lot of these cases because actually in the the flip side of that is understanding that the the people that you are interacting with um may have personal um uh maybe personally impacted by what you're saying 
so it is also about when you have an opinion is about also with kindness and generosity really thinking about how that might impact the uh individual that you are having that conversation with because there's plenty of times where i think these conversations do happen but they happen in a way that's not with generosity and it's not with the thought of the the other person um so for i'll give, I'll give an example because it's it's often better when you have an example in my last um organization we were we were talking about um some of the issues with um some of the communities and the the deprivation that they were facing in particular humanitarian contexts and the way that people would, were talking was from a very practical basis but actually in the room there were a number of people whose heritage were was from those places and that wasn't recognized acknowledged appreciated and they weren't brought into the the conversation so i think it's about being more mindful in conversations um and for for us and um we're looking at getting we have a um an edi forum but we're also looking at how we can ensure that all of the different networks that we have within the organization because we're fortunate in our size to have a number of the networks that actually we bring them together and have a holistic conversations that bring all of these these points together so that voices aren't excluded because it's quite easy to exclude voices that you don't agree with and actually you're poorer as a result i hope that kind of answers the question in rachel i'd like yeah um i'd like to add into that i think a part of for me what's the kind of grounding of this kind of question is this idea of safe spaces and i don't agree that safe spaces are possible necessarily because you can't be safe for everybody but i think um the idea of safe spaces or is around creating parameters for why people have gathered together so in terms of the advice we have to give to the sector it's generally something that we have to be really bespoke about because everybody's context is different and i think that's the same thing for conversations i think every conversation is different but as long as you are transparent about what you're doing and you're and you're you act with intention and you're transparent about what those intentions are it helps a lot so if you want to create a space where people can um debate openly unafraid of kind of uh getting the language wrong then create that space invite people to join i do these things called collective um learning experiences where i invite people to come and i tend to use the faith and belief forum safe space guidance in which they give you kind of some guidance of how we want to bring to be in communication together and and that's be generous and assume generosity um and good intentions and um speak only from your own experience rather than generalizing um say like all men when you're just one man and you can only experience you can only speak from one point of view for example and those are really useful in terms of having people know why they're entering the conversation and um be aware of that you still have to be mindful that things will you can't control the situation and people's emotions are people's emotions but if you have come to a conversation to have an intellectual debate and someone else has come to a conversation because they want trauma healing you're going to have a different conversation and you're going to have different experiences of that conversation so it's important to know why you're coming together and then um operate within that so be respectful if you want to talk about things like white privilege as a uh, a person of color with the white person or vice versa um if you want to have that as an intellectual debate you set that up to kind of discuss you know the barriers of is race real is what is privilege is it just delineated against our racialized experiences or at what point do we need to think of things really intersectionally like does white privilege exist within low socio and economic backgrounds does it exist outside of a white dominant society that's an intellectual debate someone else saying that i didn't get a job because um 
somebody looked at racialized me as a person of color and this was really painful and I want to talk about how white privilege might have been affecting my ability to get the thing I want that person is not there to have an intellectual debate that person wants to talk about their experiences and see whether or not first they can get some kindness and some acknowledgement of their pain and then they can have a discussion about you know maybe other factors might be involved or is this really a question about racial discrimination um, and a complex one at that because white privilege is very complex it sits within conversations around colorism and other kind of debates that are intersectional and it's not something that is easily understood and brought back down to the the word itself is that the, the title can be inflammatory because people hear privilege and they hear whiteness. So they hear racialization and they hear privilege. And these are two very um, emotive things that are complicated. And um, so we're trying to understand it and we're trying and we're feeling it. And those are two different experiences. Thanks very much. Those are um, <clears throat> great answers and a great question. So uh, thanks, Ian, um, uh, even for that one. Um, uh, both of you described kind of, you know, initiatives that the National Archives can take forward. And obviously the National Archives is quite, is quite big, particularly in the cultural heritage sector, it's about five, 600 staff. Um, and obviously loads of, of museums, libraries, archives um, are quite tiny. They might even have one person. Um, so what, what creative things, the, the theme is inclusive innovation here. So we, we need to be innovative. If you're, if you're a, um, a one person band in, in an institution or there are two of you, what can you do in, in those really, tight resource situations where you really want to make a difference and you you know you do want to kind of um initiate some of these discussions but that or you know in, increase your representation or whatever it is what can you do in 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 some of these really tiny cultural heritage institutions for those where there's there's tight resources in terms of finance in terms of um staffing in terms of you know even at a basic level, if, if there's only one person in the organisation uh, and, and that's a white person, then you're, you're a 100 percent white organisation. So, you know, what, what can you do creatively if you're in a small institution to to really engage and to really address some of these things in, in, in what can be quite a challenging situation in lots of ways? I'm going to go to you, Rachel, first on that one and then I'll come back to Andrea. Well, uh, I think creative is a really um, interesting, a good lens to put on that because, um, first of all, you don't need to be alone. It can feel like you've got the, if you're a lone worker or you're an entirely volunteer led organization, it can feel like you are tackling this entirely alone. First of all, just a plug to say archive sector development team offer an amazing amount of resource and support to the sector. And if you feel alone, contact the team and somebody will help you and help engage with these debates and provide you resources and advice that can really get you going. Dip into the networks within the sector as well. Maybe it could be communities of thinking and practice. Um, maybe it's networks of similar archives, um, but these can really bolster and strengthen each other. Peer networks are not just for working with people who um, are on traineeships. We all have peer networks and we should tap into them because they are a strength. But if you are... Um, alone and you or have very little budget but you really want to embed consultation which you should um it's important to think about what is that exchange if your exchange is not something that you can really like rely on as financial exchange if you can't pay people properly for their time and you get quite embarrassed about this question of financial exchange and kind of thinking about power and you get kind of looped into all of the all of the trippings of the of the this really complicated well-intentioned practice that we're all quite um I think we all have good intentions to take part in, but we can get really worried about the the accidental replication of um, oppressive practices. I think it's just important to think about what is participation. So participation is sort of you taking part in something and you're giving part of something. It is actually an exchange. So you're giving something, some knowledge, um, your time, your energy, and what are you taking? If you can't exchange money for people's engagement what can you exchange can you give them proper like work experience can you discuss with them what it is that they want that'd be the ideal um that you actually discuss with people what it is that they want to get out of it and see if you can meet that within your um the realities of your um bound your barriers and if you can't can you work with other people can you think about like a community partner can you be more creative around businesses locally um and maybe people want a platform. Can you share your platform? Is it that you can reach more people? So think creatively about what you can offer as an exchange that's not monetary if you don't have that. 
And that's within your resource and your gift to give. And it's really important when you think about consultation and, and working with other groups of people that you have this conversation first. Why are you doing it? What's your motivation for being involved and getting other people involved? Make sure that's solid and that it, that has kind of robust values and morals behind it. You're not just there to extract information from somebody. Um, but then also, what are you able to actually do? So are you consulting people on something that they actually have the power to change or not? Because don't do that. Don't, don't engage people in kind of a consultative process where they actually don't have any say and it's just a veneer. So make sure you, they have power and you've, exta you've, you've established what it is that this person, these people are involved in, what it is they want to get out of and how you can exchange um, something transparently and with intention. I'm always going to come back to that. Making things bespoke, you decide intentionally what your actions are going to be and you're transparent about it from the start. That's great. Sorry, I'm not, uh, I'm just scribbling some of that down because I think it's really inspiring. And I think I really like the idea of an exchange, particularly, you know, as you said, if, if, if you're a small institution and you can't afford to pay people that that exchange, I, I really like that idea. I think it's great. Andrea, do you want to, to come in on that at all? Perfect. Uh, perfect answer. And Rachel has been working with the sector um, for some time and knows it far better than, than I do. And I think very eloquently, um said what I've got written down in terms of what I what I've been thinking so um nothing to add okay in which case I will thank you very much um uh I want to pick up on something that um I'd, I'd be quite interested in asking. Um, so obviously, lots of people, we, we know across the sector, archives, libraries, museums, you know, there is a very, very low representation of, uh, of lots of communities, um, ethnic minority communities, but also in terms of all sorts of other communities as well, um, disabilities, LGBTQ+, and lots of other communities. But obviously, that's that can be a real issue. So how do we attract staff to a sector where they they don't see themselves represented? You talked about this earlier, Rachel, about you know being able to bring your authentic um, self to work in a safe place. And if you're like the only person from your community, um, uh, that's that can be quite tough. Um, or even if it's one of a really small number, there are all sorts of challenges that that, that brings. So if institutions genuinely want to increase their diversity uh, and you genuinely want to work for that institution but you think wow I'm going to be the only person from my community or one of a very small number uh, that brings all sorts of challenges the, uh, loads of emotional labor you know people can you know we, if we want to be diverse if you're for example a person of color people kind of want you to do all the work about that you know tell us what to do about this and there, there can be a lot of emotional load a lot of pressure on people how do we break through those kind of those good intentions but that kind of almost zero diversity or very low diversity to a broader diversity without putting a huge unbearable load on on those pioneers who join the institution first from any particular community Rachel can I come to you first on that one sure um so the main thing I would say is that um there is an uneven expectation on people from marginalized communities to represent larger communities. And the reality of representation is you can only represent people who have nominated you to represent them. I could not, for example, represent my sister because she and I are very different, but on paper, we're the same. Same ethnicity, close to the same age, we've got the same parents. But she would not have, she's not nominated me to speak on her behalf and I definitely can't represent her perspective. So we need to make sure that we're mindful that we're not asking people to represent a larger group of people that they may not feel equipped to represent, want to represent, and haven't actually been given the authority to represent. Um, second of all, I think something that I needed to learn being put in these situations was how to say no. And I would encourage people who are joining these organizations as, um, as pioneers um, to be really confident in the fact that you can say, that is outside of my experience, that is outside of my... Um, comfort zone I would rather be join you in the learning than be an educator because at that point you step back and you're allowing yourself to it's actually it's it can feel easy to provide solutions when you know instinctively what you think the answer is because of your lived experience but actually in terms of sustainable growth for an organization empowering other people to find the solutions is actually what would embed change um, so whilst it might feel like the right thing to do to solve the problem to be a quick win you can agree to be at the table and join the conversation without leading the conversation. Um, and that can help 
a lot in the future it, going forward in your own position your, your tendency to burn out um comes quite high with people who off the off the solution as as um a person with that insight and using lived experience which is a different emotional toil toil than using intellectual experience because often some of this is linked to trauma and it's very difficult to operate in a um, when you're recalling trauma um there's some interesting books around how trauma actually is embodied um and i would encourage us all to kind of think more about trauma-informed practice especially since we've all gone through a collective trauma recently with the pandemic um so that would be my advice and so people asking the questions to be mindful of that like are you extracting information you could be curious that's very good but um is that person a willing participant have you asked their consent to be participating based on their lived experience because maybe they want to participate based on their interests maybe they are the person um, from a racially diverse background but actually their real passion is knitting and if you wanted to get them involved you engage them in a conversation about knitting and they really add value to that conversation about the thing that they're passionate about but maybe they too have gone through an, an experience of being in a being a minority most of their life and are not really equipped to think about their own racial identity because they're in survival mode um, so it's, it's important that people are willing participants when they're using their lived experience and that um, we are encouraged to join the conversation rather than lead. Okay. That's brilliant. Andrea, conscious of time and another question has come in, so I'm, I'm not going to ask you to, to comment on, on that. Apologies, because we are running very, t uh, very tight on time. But Graham has put a question in. Um, he said he's joined late, so sorry if he's missed this. And we did talk, Graham, a little bit about um, recruitment earlier. So do catch up with the recording, um, which will be available in a couple of days time. Uh, but he's asked, does TNA have any plans to make recruitment more inclusive? And he's particularly uh, interested in neurodiversity. Um, but obviously, he said you could it, it can apply to other EDI areas. So how, how do you plan to do that? So I'm going to push that one to you, Andrea. And thanks very much, Graham, uh, for the questions. We've got about two minutes, Andrea, so you have to speak quickly. I promise. <laughs> I promise I'll be quick. Um, get people involved. So, you know, this is very much um, what Rachel was talking about, is when we um, were recruiting, for example, the head of, of diversity, equity and inclusion, all the questions and our approach we went to the different networks in the organization and the chairs of those networks so they um had they were nominated to speak on behalf of so very important that you're talking to the right people um and we got them involved they were involved in the peer panel and the 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 kind of discussion that happened with colleagues was then part of the actual decision making. And that's the important part is that at each part, you need to think about how do I get different perspectives into the conversation and make making sure that whatever you're doing isn't putting in more barriers for people um, that you haven't really thought about. So get get nominated people involved because they will they will tell you, um, and that's what they've signed up to do. So um, embrace that. And um, I know we're very very tight. So the last thing that um, I think it was really important to on a practical level is around peer networks. We tend to have peer networks ourselves is if you encourage peer networks, um, if you have a small um, number of people in your organization, you're then extending your reach. And if you actually put that on your websites and you, you show that you are committed to it, then actually you might get a di more diverse group of people applying to roles when you have them. You've got to be visibly proactive in order to signal that actually people are welcomed 